Good morning. Hey, it's great to see you this morning. I hope you've had a wonderful week and looking forward to our time together as we come to worship and to give praise to our wonderful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We not only want to welcome those that are gathered here in the sanctuary, but also those who will, that will be participating in our worship service at home through our live streaming. We want to also welcome you as we join together. I hope uh, in a few moments when Kevin comes to lead us in some of our opening, in our, in our opening hymns, you'll join with us all as we sing together, whether at home or here in the sanctuary. I know some have asked, well, do we need to leave our mask on? Well, uh, yes, we do, but that just means we need to sing a little louder. Uh, don't worry with the mask. Nobody knows it's you, all right? So that just gives us a little more encouragement, hopefully, when it comes to singing together. We do want to remind you of just a few announcements regarding some of the activities that will be coming up in the days and weeks ahead. Of course, most of our activities have been postponed uh, as a result of the uh, pandemic. Uh, we shared last week that we will not be having vacation Bible school this summer, but we hope to have some activities later uh, in this uh, season uh, for our children, but we will not be having VBS that we had scheduled earlier uh, for the month of July. Also this week, uh, we will be putting together the newsletter, which will be for two months, both July and August. So if you have any information that you need to get out for the church for either of those months, please contact the church office tomorrow. Uh, let Debbie know, and we'll try to get that included in the newsletter that will be coming out in just a couple of weeks. Uh, also, Tuesday, our ladies' Bible study will be meeting. Uh, they will be meeting over in the room across from the parlor. Plenty of room there uh, for social distancing, and if you have any questions, you can ask Alice about the Bible study, but they will be planning that meeting this Tuesday. And then on Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary, we'll be continuing our study on overcomers, and Pastor Kevin will be leading that, and we would ask if you do come, please uh, bring a mask. Uh, we will have everybody spaced out, so there will be plenty of room. Uh, we'll be finishing that study up here very soon, and so I hope if you can come, you'll be with us on Wednesday. And then, believe it or not, at the end of the week, uh, this next weekend uh, is uh, beginning of summer. And, of course, everybody knows what next Sunday is, don't you? It's Father's Day, right? And uh, if any of my children are watching, just Lowe's coupons and, and gift cards will be fine, all right? But, uh, no, Father's Day, we'll be having a special service and looking forward to that and hope you can come as we recognize and express our appreciation toward our fathers. Now, sorry, Mom, we were closed for Mother's Day, so you'll just have to wait. <laughs> but we're glad that we're able to celebrate Father's Day together. Also this morning, we have a special announcement concerning our, our deacon nominations. And uh, Gary, who's going to make that, he's our chairman of deacons. So Gary, if you'd step up here. Where's Gary? There he comes. Gary, if you'd step up here and make that announcement for us. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yes, as uh, the deacon vice chair, I uh, want to take this opportunity to remind everybody that it's that time of year um, we need to be taking up nominations for our deacons in training. Um, we don't have the nomination ballots in the bulletin this week, but we will have them for you in next week's bulletin, as well as you can also get them from your Bible study leaders. Um, if you're in a Bible study, uh, and you're not here this morning or, or next Sunday morning, um, or ask any deacon for a nomination ballot. Um, I would like to ask everybody to be uh, in prayer, you know, prayerfully consider for this important position. It's an important ministry of, of the church, and uh, so if everybody can come together and, and, and pray about that. Um, the nominations, the ballots, will be taken up the week of June 28th. And again, you can hand them in, you can put them in the offering plate or basket Sunday, the June 28th, or actually anytime that week, um, the week of the 28th, 
we can receive the ballots again if you would like to hand them in to your bible study leader or any deacon you know that would that's fine and again just uh i ask that everybody be in prayerful consideration of this important position thank you very much Thank you, Gary, and of course, our, our chairman of Deacons, uh, Daryl Buckout, and his wife, Leanne, are away. They've been in Arizona uh, dealing uh, with family, help, helping out, I think, uh, Leanne's father-in-law, or father, uh, Daryl's father-in-law. But uh, we certainly want to keep them in our prayers, and hopefully they'll be back here before too much longer. Uh, but I uh, appreciate Gary taking care of that for us this morning, and of course, we do want to be uh, praying as we consider those individuals that will be uh, nominated uh, to serve as deacons in the church. It's always been a joy to work with our deacons. I appreciate our deacons, and they've been doing a wonderful job with the family ministry plan during this uh, pandemic, uh, keeping up with our folks and finding out the situation that many are dealing with at home and, of course, identifying any needs that we can minister to. Well, let's go ahead and begin our time of worship together. And so I'm going to ask Kevin to come and lead us in our opening hymn. Kevin. I'm going to ask that you join with me this morning as we open our worship in song. Our hymn is number 356 in your hymnal, Redeemed, How I Love to Proclaim It. Let's stand as we sing. If you're sitting singing along at home, go ahead and stand up in your living room with us this morning. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed in His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed. His child and forever I am. time of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for allowing us to meet together here this morning. We thank you for all who are in attendance. We thank you for those who are watching us online as we come together with one heart, Father, just to lift up praises to you. Father, we thank you for being with us this week, for getting us through another week, and we look forward to the week that's ahead of us, Lord, as we serve you, Lord, as we have the opportunity to uh, see other people, Lord, to share the good news of the gospel with them. And uh, Father, I just uh, praise you for all you do for us, Lord. I ask you to be with those who could not be here this morning uh, because of illness or maybe because of travel or other reasons, that you just bless their, bless them, Lord, and uh, just guide them and allow them to be together with us again soon um, according to your appointed time. Father, I thank you for the service this morning. I thank you for this building that we're able to meet in. And, uh, 
where your word is proclaimed. And Father, I just ask that you help us to be the light that we need to be in this world, Lord. Uh, there's so much uh, division going on right now. Father, we need you more than ever in our lives uh, to help straighten some of this out, Lord. And we know that it's only going to come through your word. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you that he went to the cross to die for our sins. And Father, we look for that, forward to that day when we're all gathered together in unity around, the, around your throne. Father, bless this service, Lord. Just guide and direct in all we do. In your son's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask that you stand and join with me in song once again. Our hymn is number 499 in your hymnal. I will sing the wondrous story standing once again.
Thank you, Tiffany, for blessing our hearts in song this morning. If you have your Bibles with you, we're going to look once again in the book of Psalms, the hymn book of the Bible. And uh, this morning we're going to be looking in the second Psalm. So that's a pretty easy Psalm to find, Psalm 2. And we're going to hopefully answer the question, when will there be peace on earth? As we look at the world around us, and especially as we look at the events that are taking place in our own nation today uh, with uh, protests and in some places riots, we hear of occupation even in some of the cities out west, and we hear, of course, of the rise in violence and the divisions that exist within our nation, not just politically, but also some of the racial divisions that we are being confronted with and having to deal with today. Uh, many are asking the question, when will we have peace on earth again? You know, I mentioned earlier during the announcements that this coming uh, weekend, uh, I believe either Friday or Saturday, is the first day of summer and it seems a little early to be talking about Christmas unless you work for Walmart seems like they always start kind of early but you know during the uh, Christmas season usually we sing a lot of hymns and songs uh, about peace on earth I'm reminded of the song by Henry Longfellow called uh, I heard the bells on Christmas day it says, I heard the bells on Christmas Day, the old familiar carols play, and mild and sweet, their, mild and sweet rather, their songs repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to man. And then down in the third stanza, he says, and in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and it mocks the song of peace on earth goodwill to man. That particular hymn was actually written during the Civil War 150 years ago, uh, yet we still see, even today, I guess in some ways, we could ask the same question that Longfellow was asking. When will there be peace on earth? Well, if we look together in Psalm 2, we see that the answer to that question is there will be peace on earth when the Prince of Peace rules and reigns upon this earth, that is not a Republican or a Democrat, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look together in Psalm 2. The Bible says, Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and notice against his anointed one. Say, <clears throat> excuse me, say, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision, that is contempt. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and he will terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree that the Lord said to me, You are my son. <clears throat> Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron and you will dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise and warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Lord, or rather kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are those who take refuge in him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come in your presence today. We humble ourselves before you. And Father, we certainly intercede today for our nation, our community. 
Father, we pray as we have been confronted once again with many of the issues that so divide this nation. Father, it's easy to point fingers, but Father, I pray today we would examine our own hearts. And Father, we would recognize the very fact that if we are going to be at peace with our neighbor, that we must first be at peace with you. Father, we pray for the leaders of this land. We pray, Father, that they would lay aside the political rhetoric that has been taking place for so many years, and that, Father, they would seek your will and work together to bring about unity and healing to this country. Father, we pray also for many of the families that are hurting today, many who have been victims of violence. And we pray, Father, too, that you would give them comfort and peace, even in their time of grief. Lord, we know that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that you sit upon your throne in heaven. But Father, we pray today that you will reign and rule in the heart and the lives of your people. And that as Jesus has told us, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Father, may we work to be peacemakers and not agitators during this very difficult time in our nation. For we pray this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I want you to look with me for a few moments at this wonderful psalm as we consider the way that we can first experience peace in our own life and then secondly, so that we can experience peace, hopefully, in our nation. Notice with me, first of all, the rebellion of man. The rebellion of man. We see in the first few verses of this wonderful psalm that the psalmist begins to address not only the rulers of the land, but also the people under the leadership of these rulers. In verse 1 of Psalm 2, it says, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? In other words, though, we see later in verse 2 directly are mentioned the kings and the leaders of the nations. We need to understand that whenever the word of God addresses the leaders of a nation, it is also addressing the people under that leadership. For example, in the prophets, when God spoke to the king of Israel, he was not just pointing out the error of the life or the ways of the king. He was dealing with the sins of the nation. Likewise, when we see here in this psalm, the psalmist addresses the kings and the leaders of this world He's not just talking about the President of the United States or the, uh, the Congress of the United States or the Senate of the United States, but rather he's talking about us. He's talking about the people that make up this nation as well as the people of the earth that make up the various nations of this world. And he is addressing a problem. Why is there unrest? Why is there violence? Why is there so much trouble in the world today? And we see as we look at this psalm that when it comes to the real issue that is confronting us, it's not just the divisions that divide man against man, but really it's the division that divides mankind from his creator. That it is not that man is at war with man that is the problem, but rather man is at war with man because he is at war with his God. And so the real issue that we see being addressed here is the fact that we have fallen from God's purpose and God's plan. That we have sinned against the will and the word of God. And that if we ever hope to be at peace with one another, 
we must first be at peace with our Creator. You see, the Bible tells us that man has a problem. That problem is not a health issue, it's not a political issue, it's not an educational issue, not that those issues are not important, but that it is a spiritual issue because man has sin. Now, man is not a sinner because he has sinned, but rather man sins because he is a sinner. <laughs> man has turned his back on his creator. Regardless of male or female, regardless of one's race, regardless of one's nationality, regardless of where we come from, our social standing, no matter who we are, the Bible says, listen, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all have the same problem. It's a hard problem. The Bible addresses this problem for us in Romans chapter 3. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church of Rome, asks this question. Are we Jews any better off than the rest? Paul, being of, uh, uh, of the nation of Israel, being Jewish, asked the questions, do, do the Jews have a, a better relationship with God because they are Jews than the Gentiles? We might ask the question today, are the Baptists any better off? Well, obviously you don't know very much about Baptists, do you? <laughs> are, are the Methodists better off? Or are the evangelicals better off? Well, Paul answers that question very clearly when he says, no, not at all. For we are already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, that is, everybody, is under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Now, Paul goes back to the Psalms, the very place where we began we started in Psalm 2. Paul is quoting from Psalm 14 when he says, No one understands and no one seeks God. All have turned aside together. They have become worthless. No one does good, no, not even one. Their throat is as an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace, listen to verse 17, and the way of peace they have not known. And then kind of to sum up the whole situation, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Really in this verse, we see identified three problems with man beginning in verses 10 through 12, and that starts with the character of man. There is none righteous, no, not one. That is to say, listen, when we stand in the very presence of God, we, we stand clothed in our own unrighteousness, and the Bible says when it comes to our righteousness, that the righteousness of man is made up of filthy rags. Doesn't matter if you're black or white, we all have the same problem, and that problem is sin. And what Paul is trying to say to us today is the only solution to that problem is the same solution, and that is the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, because of man's fallen nature, if given the opportunity, man will give in to that nature and, and he will sin. Some say we need to change the environment of man. We can make man's environment a little better. He'll make better choices. But we need to remember that Adam and Eve were put into a perfect place, the Garden of Eden. And yet in that perfect place, having all their physical needs met, they chose to sin against God. Some say, well, we need to educate man. Well, that just makes... Man, a smart sinner. <laughs> Just makes him a little more creative 
when it, uh, when it comes to sin. Some say, well, our, our problem is economics and we need to redo our economical system. Well, that just makes man a wealthy sinner <laughs> so that he has more resources to sin in some more creative ways. You see, regardless of the solution that we can offer for man by man, we see it doesn't really address the true situation, which is the fallen heart of man. We see evidence of this fallen character in the communication of man. Notice how the Bible describes man's communication. Their throat is as an open grave. In other words, when, when man speaks, it is a, a stench to the ears of God. I think sometimes we fail to understand how really corrupt and vile our, our communication has become. I mean, my wife and I, we almost have made it a game to count the number of times we hear profanity anytime we turn on the television. It's unfortunate, but it's there. That is the nature of our culture. The Bible says it. Man's language is filled with vulgarity, blasphemy, and profanity. And that it is a stench to the ears of the God who created us. Notice the conduct of man. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In other words, the Bible says man has an infatuation and an affection toward violence. People say, well, I, I'm not violent by nature. Well, look at our culture today. What happens when we pass an accident on the highway? Well, traffic slows down. They call it rubbernecking. What are people doing? They want to get a look, don't they? They want to see what's happening. What are the movies that are most popular today? Well, they're movies usually that are very what? Violent in nature. We've made violence a means of entertainment. I know I shared in the past, there was a movie out a few years ago called John Wick. And uh, I don't know exactly how many murders occurred in that movie, but apparently there were many. Then there was a John Wick too. And the way they advertised that movie, they said there are twice as many murders in John Wick 2 as there was in John Wick 1. Let me tell you how popular that movie is. There's already a John Wick 3. What does that tell us about mankind? There is an infatuation with violence. We look back to the 21st century in the Second World War, there were more than 80 million people killed in a five-year period during that war. You see, the Bible says that man's problem it is not an intellectual problem. It is not a political problem. It is not a physical problem. It's a spiritual problem. We are in rebellion toward God. And until we repent of our sin, until we seek the forgiveness and mercy of God himself, we're never going to deal with the true problem than man has. Consequently, when we look at all that is going on in the world today and we hear folks talking about how we need to seek forgiveness from one another because of the sins of our past, well, it is always good to seek reconciliation and forgiveness from those that we have offended by our actions. But my friend, we need to realize we first and foremost need to seek the forgiveness of the God against whom we have sinned. And understand and realize today in our world, in our nation, in our homes, in our church, in our communities, that there can be no peace until we make peace with the God who created us. Notice the response of the Father to the actions that are taking place in the world, first of all, 
3,000 years ago when this psalm was written, but also, I believe, in some of the activity that is taking place today. In verse 4, it says, He who sits in heaven does what? He laughs. Now, it's not to say that God is entertained by the violence and all that is taking place in the world because this is in reference to a laughter of contempt. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them, listen, in his wrath. And he will terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. In other words, God is not sitting in heaven today wringing his hands over the events that are taking place in our nation. God's not worried about the election that's coming up in November. God's not worried about what is happening among the nations of this world. He's not worried about North Korea. He's not worried about Iran. And he's not worried about the United States. God is still sitting on his throne. Man cannot, nor will he, dethrone the Lord God. And God is still working to achieve his plan, which is to establish his anointed one, the Lord Jesus Christ, as ruler of the world in which we live today. Notice with me four things in this particular passage. First of all, God still sits on his throne above the world. As a matter of fact, the Psalmist later describes the world as the footstool of God. That God is still on his throne and he is still in charge. Therefore, if we really want to see a solution to some of the problems, we shouldn't be writing our congressmen, we should be praying to our God. Secondly, he sees the contempt for him in the world. He sees those who mock the word of God. He sees those who flaunt their immorality. He sees those who carry out deeds of violence against others. He is aware of our situation. He is not ignorant of our concerns. Thirdly, he speaks judgment upon this world. God has already judged this world. This world has been judged. The days of this world are numbered. One day, my friend, God is going to say enough, and the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come again. You see, that is our hope. My friend, that's why we can be optimistic about the future. Not because of anyone that's going to be elected in November, but because of the one who is ultimately coming to rule and to reign, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice with me, fourthly, he sets his anointed one to rule over this world. This wonderful psalm is, is actually a, a, a prophetic word about the coming of the Messiah. It's not about the coronation of David or any particular king over Israel, but rather it tells us about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look again in verse 2 when it speaks of the anointed one. That word anointed one literally in the Hebrew is the word Messiah. It is in reference, of course, to the coming of the Messiah, whom we know is the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice in verse 7, where it says, The Lord said to me, You are my son, the day I have begotten you. That particular verse is quoted in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5, and it is in reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we are looking at this particular psalm, 
and we are seeing the response of the Father, and we say, well, what on earth is God doing? Well, I'll tell you what he is doing. He is getting ready to send the Lord Jesus Christ to rule and to reign and to bring peace on this earth. Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, For the day of the Lord will come like a thief. That simply means that it will come unexpectedly. That's how a thief comes. He doesn't call the house and say, Listen, I'm planning on coming over to your house today at 3 o'clock. I'd appreciate it if you weren't home. That's not how a thief works. He comes when you don't expect him. Well, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought we to be in lives of holiness and godliness? In other words, he said, if the Lord's come again, how should we live? Well, we should, but should live each and every day as if today is the day that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming again. Notice Peter goes on, waiting for the hastening of the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt away, and they shall all be burned. You want to talk about global warming? <laughs> Somebody says, do you believe in global warming? Absolutely. Read the Bible. <laughs> I mean, the Bible says that one day all of this will pass away. But according to his promises, we are waiting for a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness will dwell. You know, if you look in the Bible, there's something interesting about righteousness. Wherever you see righteousness, many times you'll see with it peace. You can't have peace without righteousness. As we look in the world today, we don't see a very righteous world. As I mentioned earlier, the Bible says that when it comes to the righteousness of man, it is as filthy rags. Consequently, we don't see a lot of peace. If we desire peace, we must first desire righteousness. That is, we are to desire that which is right according to the word and the will of God. Whenever we ignore that which is right, according to the word and to the will of God, then we give up on the hope of peace. Notice with me thirdly in this psalm, the rule of the sun. The rule of the sun. In verse 7 it says, And I will tell of the decree that the Lord said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and you shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. We see these verses are in reference, as I mentioned earlier, to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is in reference to his second coming, and not his first coming. You see, the Bible speaks twice as much about the second coming of Jesus than it did the first coming. Consequently, if you literally believe, as I do and as the Bible teaches, that Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary, that he was God in human flesh, that he lived a perfect life, never sinned, that he went to the cross, willingly, died for our sins, bearing the sins of the world in his own body, that through faith in him we might become the righteousness of God, that he was buried and on the third day raised by the glory of God the Father, that 40 days later he has ascended into heaven, and that he has promised to come again. In other words, if you believe that with all of your heart, as the Bible tells us it is true, then we know that one day Jesus Christ shall indeed rule the nations of this world. 
And that is exactly what this passage is telling us about. That Jesus is coming again. That he is coming, listen, not just to be the Savior as he was the Savior in his first coming, but to be the sovereign that shall rule the nations of this world. Not to redeem as he came and redeemed us from our sin by the shedding of his blood on the cross, but he's coming to rule with a rod of iron. That when he comes again, he will bring with him peace on earth. That's why Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4, talking about the rule of the Messiah in this world. He shall judge among the nations, and he shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. And nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. In other words, my friend, listen, there, there's coming a day. There's coming a day when we won't need the Army, the Navy, and the Marines, where we won't need a military, where we won't need a police force, where we won't need prisons and jails, because there's coming a day when the Prince of Peace shall rule and reign. However, until that day comes, we're going to need someone to restrain the evil of this world. We need to realize that there's evil in this world because we live in a fallen world and we have an enemy that is the devil who wants to destroy us. And the men and the women that put on the uniform, whether of our military or our law enforcement, that the vast majority of these individuals do so for our own protection and our own welfare. And yes, as we pray for the coming of the Prince of Peace, we also need to pray for the men and women that stand in harm's way until that day comes. Notice with me finally, the rebuke of the Spirit. The rebuke of the Spirit. In verse 10, it says, Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Now, we could say that to a lot of our leaders today, couldn't we? <laughs> therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoicing and trembling. Kiss the Son, that is, the Lord Jesus. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are they who take refuge in him. Notice with me three things we're told to do in this passage. First of all, be wise. Don't be foolish. The Bible says in Psalm 111, verse 10, when it comes to wisdom, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and all those who practice it have a good understanding. In other words, my friend, listen, this is the warning of God. Realize that today is a blessing from God. And if you do not know Christ, today is an opportunity for you to turn from sin and to turn to Christ. And to first be right with your Creator. And then to labor to address the differences and deal with the problems so we, we can be right with one another. Be wise. But secondly, be warned. In other words, if you're not going to be wise, you better be careful because God says you will be judged. You will be held accountable. We see many of the folks running about on the streets that are doing things that they shouldn't do. They're wearing masks. I don't know if they're wearing that because of the virus or they're wearing that because they don't want to be recognized. Listen, I may not know who they are. You may not know who they are, but God knows who they are. 
I mean, you're sitting here today, everybody in this auditorium got a mask on. I think I know who's who. I ran into a church member the other day at Lowe's. I had my mask on. He had his mask on. He said, preacher, is that you? I said, yeah, I'm watching. (laughs) (laughs) No, you don't have to worry about the preacher watching, but my friend, you need to realize God is always watching. He warns us. He says, there's coming a day when you're going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. (laughs) And you're going to have to give an account. Be wise. Be warned. And then thirdly, be willing. Notice he says, listen, kiss the sun. Now we say, oh, social distancing. Can't do that. Well, (laughs) Well, what he means is receive the sun. Accept the sun. Recognize who he is. Respond appropriately to him. And make this king your king, the king of your life, the king of your heart. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In other words, listen, that's what it means. It means to respond appropriately to who Jesus is. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But the only question is, is he your king? Is he your Lord? Is he sitting on the throne of your heart? He's sitting on the throne of heaven, but is he sitting on the throne of your heart? Because that's all that is really going to matter when the king comes. And he rules and he reigns upon this world. We need to realize and we need to understand that Jesus is coming again. For the believer, for the child of God, that that is our hope and that is our prayer. My friend, for the person that doesn't know Christ, it should be their greatest concern and their greatest fear. Because Jesus is coming again. And he will rule and he will reign. And he will bring peace on earth. So like John in the book of Revelation, it should be our prayer today. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Let's just add a little bit to it. Come today, Lord. Come today. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Jesus is Lord, but my friend, is he your Lord? Jesus is king, but is he your king? He sits on the throne of heaven, but does he sit on the throne of your heart? If not, let me encourage you right where you are. As the Bible says, to kiss the hand of the king, let me ask you, would you receive? the Lord Jesus Christ in your life and heart today. You can do so by just praying with me, Lord Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner. Lord Jesus, I believe you died for my sin on the cross. I pray you forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart, sit on the throne of my life, and be my king today. Thank you for saving me, Lord Jesus. Give me the courage, I pray, to tell others about you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me this morning, we're going to give you an opportunity to respond. We're going to have an invitation. I want to invite you to come. Maybe this morning you're saying, well, preacher, I know I'm saved, but you know I haven't been baptized. I need to be baptized. Every child of God should be a baptized believer in Jesus Christ. Maybe you're saying, well, preacher, I'm not a church member. And every born-again baptized believer should be the member of a local church actively involved in ministry. But preacher... There's some issues in my life, and I just don't know what to do. There's some problems in my home, maybe just the problems that are facing us today in this, in this world around us. And I just need to pray. Well, you come forward. You can pray at the altar. You can pray at one of the empty pews we have take off. Listen, if God is dealing with your heart today and you need to come, you come as we stand together and sing. Kevin's going to come and lead us under invitation. You come. Join with me as we close our worship on this number 743 in your own wonderful peace, standing as we close.
far away in the depths of my spirit tonight rolls a melody sweeter than song in celestial like strains it in ceaselessly falls or my soul like a of God, that it rules and it reigns in your heart today, and I certainly hope it is your prayer that one day this old world in which we live will experience that same peace when the Lord Jesus Christ shall return in all of his glory. May the Lord bless you. May his grace and peace be upon you today. May he guide you in the days ahead until he brings you safely once again to this place where we can worship and serve our wonderful Lord and Savior together. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you today just for the blessing of life itself. And Lord, we do come again and we intercede for our nation. Father, we pray for the circumstances that have brought about so much unrest. And Lord, we do ask for reconciliation among the various races that make up this country. And Father, we pray that we would learn to look at people as Jesus does, with compassion and love, recognizing, Father, that ultimately we all come from the same father, Adam, and realizing that we all have the same problem that Adam had. We are sinners. And seeing, Father, that the solution to that problem is also the same. <clears throat> And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Father, rather than arguing politics, I pray that we would look for the opportunities to share the marvelous gospel of Christ with those that we meet, realizing that one day when Jesus shall come, we shall behold him and we shall be in his presence and there shall be peace on earth. We thank you for this hope that we have in Jesus Christ, for it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. 